Hello, good participants and listeners from around the world. I'm Kristen Schwartz, licensed midwife and MC for Gold Learning. And here at Gold, we are in the process of recording the presentations of a brand new lecture pack titled Complex Medical Issues in the Lactating Parent Lecture Pack. And we can all imagine how medical issues in the lactating parent can often create difficulties with breast or chest feeding and pose a challenge for the lactation care provider. So in this uh, special package, uh, we are focusing on providing knowledge and skills to help with these particular situations. And uh, what we like to do here at Golds before we release this package is get together with our speakers so you can get to know them a little bit and uh, learn uh, what they are doing, uh, little bit about their work and of course about the presentation and with me here is Leah Deshay. Welcome Leah. Hello. Oh, Leah, it's wonderful to have you here today. Thank you so much for your time because I know how very, very busy you are. You're not only a lactation professional and educator, but you're also a busy mom, right? <laughs> I am. I've got um, four kids, technically five, although my stepdaughter is not here as often as we would like, but uh, I've got four of my own and five total, so <laughs> it's exciting around here. <laughs> it is exciting and very busy, and uh, I can only imagine, we have to tell our listeners we are in the middle of the uh, COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic right now. Yep. We, uh, we have, It's uh, March 21st, and um, tell us a little bit what you're seeing. And number one, you have to stay home with your children, so that's uh, challenging <laughs> to start with. But, but what else do you see in your world and in, in your surroundings and also with uh, in your job area? In terms of the pandemic itself? Yes. What What is happening um, where you are? Well, uh, I wish I had positive things to report. I mean, I do have positive things to report, but I'll, I'll start with the challenges. It's pretty typical. So I live in Long Beach, which is in greater Los Angeles, and we are the second most populated city in the country, uh, although our county is the most populated county in the country. So New York is, uh, has a much higher like per capita concentration so it's a lot of people closer together but in terms of the entire county Los Angeles uh, bears the burden of the majority of people in the United States mm -hmm. so uh, I've been really surprised everybody's doing very well with social distancing I have been to clinic twice in the last week although I won't be going back because um, my pediatric uh, pulmonologist who's the director um, and we're all young women of color which is interesting but also mildly terrifying under the circumstances she works at our two local hospitals one of which is a children's a women and children's hospital along with all of the other ICU units and the other one's a standard hospital but still has I think 15 um, OB beds she came into contact with a patient who later tested positive for COVID um, and she has not been able to get tested yet and so we I haven't seen her for almost two weeks so it's unlikely that I would have gotten anything from her um, however in the last it's been nine days since I was in the clinic physically last to see a patient and five days ago uh, two of our MAs pretty much got all of the symptoms and ended up going to local their local Kaiser facility yeah so it's been it's it's not a hoax at least not over here um, it's been very very tangible here in terms of our patients it's so difficult to tell because we don't know we have no idea what's going on with them to be honest we've had really limited hours um, we're very concerned about our new babies I know um, two of the moms that were supposed to come in to see me on Saturday um, they canceled we changed our hours once we found out about the Washington outbreak so that I was seeing patients with the obstetrician on Saturdays and no other patients were coming in because we were trying to limit exposure. So just new babies and pregnant moms. And we had two different entrances to the clinic. We're very privileged that we have a beautiful facility. So the pregnant women were coming into one side and um, the parents of new babies were coming into the other and only I was seeing them and we were keeping them in the parking lot and <laughs> just calling them to come in one at a time. So we thought we were you know, doing as good as we could. Uh, but yeah. We have had quite a few parents who I'm really worried about because 
we can't tell if, and you know, there's no telling now, like, is it choreo? Is it the flu? Is it one of all these other things because they're at home? We can't test them. And now we're telling people self-quarantine until you can't breathe, which I think is really, really anxiety producing for so many moms, you know? So yes. that's pretty much where we are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, first of all, I want to congratulate you and your team there that you were so proactive having this wonderful system in place trying to, you know, limit exposure as much as you could there. And but yeah, it, it is very, very scary because now I, uh, we are being told not yeah, not everybody is getting tested, even if they have no. symptoms, they're told to be yeah. a stay home. Um, you know, and, and that can be very, very terrifying, especially for a mom with a baby, yep. um, you know, because we don't know what's going on. Is that the, you know, is this cold symptoms? Is it respiratory? Is it asthma? What is going on? Right. And exactly. uh, if we don't test, we don't know. So that is very anxiety inducing, uh, obviously, as well. Um, are you already under shelter in place? Is everything locked down in your area? Well, we've been under shelter in place for four days, maybe five days. I don't know. So we, when the quarantine, when they, when they first requested quarantine, like from the governor, um, the school started getting shut down almost two and a half weeks ago. So we are a bit ahead of everybody else, as far as I know. Um, I want to say by a few days, but you can't minimize that in this situation because every day makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So when the shelter in place came down, it you know everything had already been shut down. If that makes sense, um, it's also a little bit it's a little bit odd because most people's concept of what shelter in place would be is some like totalitarian like tanks going through your neighborhood and all of these other things and I actually cannot find a police officer to save my life like I sat on the phone because I had a question yesterday for non-emergency and couldn't get through to them usually we see a fair amount of cops out here I know besides Chicago and um, and New York we I, I forget if we're always in competition, but you know, there's a heavy law enforcement presence out here, um, not in a bad way, but just because we have such a high population. So on a normal day driving around, I will see at least one cop car somewhere in my neighborhood. Um, and I know my police officers and everything else. And now it's like, I can't find them. And it's so ironic because there are no cars on the road and that includes like, like I don't know where the National Guard is. I had a friend who was like, you guys are in shelter in place. And I was like, nope, I couldn't tell you where the National Guard is. I haven't seen them at all. Yeah. So it's just pretty eerie, you know. Um, I will say that when I went to clinic uh, to pick something up by myself and I was doing virtual there, so it was nobody else, just me. Um, it's a lot safer and we have cleaning yeah. people coming at night. Um, there was nobody on the road and there is nothing I'm born and raised Angelino um, you know our traffic can only compete with Manhattan and I can only imagine yes <laughs> I've never ever it was so strange like just getting on the freeway and not seeing any cars made me want to go home because yeah. it was such, such an odd feeling so I am mildly encouraged that people are yeah. taking it very seriously where I am I am incredibly outraged that people are not taking it seriously in other parts of the country I mean I can't blame them because their leadership isn't taking it seriously if that makes sense but yeah. Yeah. It'll be very interesting how things turn out. Very, and, and it feels like every day uh, it's changing and shifting. Yes. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm a midwife practicing here in South Florida, and our health department has sent out information that we are now um, supposed to do our appointment via telehealth and and so on it's still a little bit vague how we, we need to do this and how insurance coverage is and such so are you in a similar situation um well it's interesting for me because um, I do uh, moonlight at the local midwifery I have been in a community collaboration with them for the last six years and so I do their support groups for free and see um, a great deal of their home visit referrals, if that makes sense. And I've always incorporated telehealth into my services for um, for my private patients, at least for the last almost five years. So for me, it isn't, I'll say that I'm probably much more comfortable with it than those who are trying to get up to speed if it hasn't already been part of their uh, clinical packaging. Um, bless you, that was my three month old. <laughs> um, but the difficulty right now is not actually for a private practice, it is for our community clinic. So our community clinic, uh, the burden of our population there 
um, are use Medi-Cal, which is California State's own Medicaid system, specifically for those who are not seniors. So anybody from birth all the way up until I think either 55 or 60, I don't remember the age, but right up until um, Social Security um, eligibility. So for us, the concern with that is twofold. They previously have never authorized services for telehealth, which means that they don't have any coding for the building. So that's like fairly frustrating. So we have already gotten online with the system, but as you mentioned, we're not certain about how the billing coding is supposed to work. The greater issue than that, though, is that we're dealing with a population that lacks access to the technology to be able yeah. to consistently meet what is required for telehealth on their end, if that makes sense. And so, honestly, the greatest problem there, and the irony that is truly, truly keeping me up at night is that this is the population that needs us the most. And so now they cannot access us in person. And I, this is a situation where, like, we give out taxi vouchers on a regular basis. And, you know, we help people get bus passes so that they can make it to their appointments. That's the kind of population that I am endeavoring to serve. And I feel yeah. They need these services the most, and they are absolutely going to suffer the most in an age where we're acting like everybody can just sit home, like in a comfortable house, and talk to me on their like brand new Mac computer. That's not feasible for a lot of my patients. Um, so that's really the situation that we're in right now. Difficult, difficult situation, and very valid point there. That people who need the services the most, they don't have access. Uh, to that, right. and that's a very difficult situation. And thank you also for the wonderful services you're doing for the midwifery community there that you're offering your services for free. I have to tell you as a midwife, I love IBCLCs, lactation professionals. You guys rock. It's wonderful. You solve our problems. <laughs> with, you know, and I have always <laughs> thank said, you. I always have a list of, uh, you know, uh, resource list with me, um, and, and I always tell my ladies, uh, my families, uh, go speak to a lactation professional before you give birth you know make a contact right they, they really are fa fantastic in what they're doing so thank you thank you for that um Absolutely. i i want to talk to you about briefly now about your presentation burning up supporting yeah. birth parents with inflammatory disorders so tell us a little bit without giving too much away because we want our listeners to come to the presentation uh what will you be presenting on um, you know, it was actually, <laughs> Jessica knows this and having to deal with me for the last few months, it was a huge challenge to try and do like a general overview of the topic because it is extensive, but it is, it's, it's really an introduction into what it is like to live with the experience of having um, an autoimmune inflammatory disorder while trying to reproduce and breastfeed, um, if I were to put it in one sentence. And so we're not coming away, like you're not, you're not going to come away with an exhaustive autoimmune class or anything like that because that wouldn't be fair in an hour. But for those who do not know what it's like to live with um, they're called invisible disabilities. So these are definitely categorized as, as disabilities. It gives you a window into the many demands um, that people have to deal with in addition to regular life just to be functional mm -hmm. and how you can try to support access to breast milk and breastfeeding um, with compassion and empathy in light of the balancing act mm -hmm. that they're that they're doing with their own health and with their own um, discomfort and stress if that makes sense absolutely yeah and thank you and I know you have also you're gonna be presenting a couple of case studies there as well right I uh, they're really I mean they're they're sort of a conglomeration of what I see on a normal basis yeah. with folks who present with these issues so yes they will be um, a combination of my hypothetical experiences with patients from these realms Wonderful. <laughs> so yeah it sounds like you will giving be giving us a lot of good information solid information and uh, some tips for our practice as well yeah and of course and within an hour there, there can't be of course an extensive uh, <laughs> um, you know workshop on on immune disorders or and and um, you know uh, inflammatory disorders, you know the the time we don't have, but it will give us a beautiful overview and uh, encourage us also to do more research and have some practical tips we can use. Yes, I certainly hope so. Well, Leah, thank you so much for sitting down here with me and chatting. And um, I want to tell you, uh, give 
um, to send you a little hug here over the <laughs> for the airwaves uh, for you and your family uh, family stay safe and and uh, we keep in touch and thank you for um, presenting with us here at gold thank you for having me and for our listeners the presentation uh, burning up supporting birth parents with inflammatory disorders is part of the lecture pack complex medical issues in the lactating parent and that will be available March 30th it's just around the corner so if you have any questions about this presentation if you want to find out more you can do so uh, if you go to goldlearning.com and also check out goldlactation.com there you will find information on this presentation and the other presentations in the lecture pack thank you again leah for your time here with me today Absolutely. and thank you also to our listening audience have a wonderful day bye bye everyone